lesson we're going to discuss the final tool of protectionism that a government may choose to employ in order to protect domestic producers from cheaper foreign competition. If you've been following the lessons on protectionism then you've already seen the video on protectionist tariffs and the video on protectionist quotas. In this lesson we're going to look at protectionist subsidies. We're going to use the same example as we have in our previous two videos on protectionism. We're going to look at the market for apples in South Korea which we have here on the right. Assume, as we have in previous lessons, that the world price of apples, PW, is lower than the domestic equilibrium price of apples in South Korea, which would be found at the intersection of SK and DK. The world supply is perfectly elastic because apple consumers in Korea can buy as many apples as they want at the world price without causing the world price of apples to rise. Due to the fact that Korea has a comparative disadvantage in apple production, Korea will import a quantity of apples from QSK to QDK under free trade. Assume now that the Korean government wishes to protect Korean apple farmers with the use of a subsidy. Let's go over to our definition here and define what a protectionist subsidy is before we look at the graphical implications of one. A subsidy you may have learned the definition of in your microeconomics unit. It's simply a payment from the government to producers for each unit of the good produced. That's a per unit subsidy. A protectionist subsidy is one that is intended to reduce the quantity of imports and allow domestic producers to sell more of their product and earn higher revenues. In other words, the intent of a protectionist subsidy is essentially the same as any other form of protectionism, to increase the sales and the revenues of domestic firms at the expense of foreign producers. Looking at our graph on the right, we can illustrate the effects of a protectionist subsidy in the market for apples in South Korea. You might have learned in microeconomics that a subsidy is a determinant of supply for a good, and a subsidy lowers the marginal cost of producing a good for the firms that receive it. In microeconomics, we learned that the supply curve represents the marginal cost, the cost of each additional apple in South Korea in this case. A subsidy reduces the marginal cost to apple growers in South Korea, and therefore shifts the marginal cost curve down, or you could say shifts the supply curve to the right. The impact of a subsidy for apple growers in South Korea would be as follows. I'll label this curve S, K, with the subsidy. The amount of the subsidy per apple can be understood as the vertical distance between the two supply curves. Since the vertical axis on a graph is price, represented by dollars or South Korean won in this case, the per unit subsidy lowers the cost of apples in South Korea by the vertical distance between the two curves. Shifts the supply curve outward and leads to an increase in the domestic supply of apples in South Korea. But how does this impact the price and the quantity demanded of apples in South Korea? Unlike the other forms of protectionism, quotas and tariffs, there's actually not going to be a change in the price of apples in South Korea when there's a subsidy for domestic growers. In fact, the world price of PW is still lower than the domestic price of apples would be with the subsidy, which would be found at the intersection of SK with subsidy and DK. So what happens instead is that due to the lower marginal cost of production, Korean apple growers are now going to be willing and able to provide a greater quantity of apples to the market at the world price of PW. So what we end up with is a new domestic quantity supplied. I'll call this QSK, that's the South Korean quantity of apples produced, one. How does this impact the quantity demanded? Since the price of apples has not changed, there has been no change in the quantity demanded. So QDK will remain the quantity of apples that Korean consumers wish to buy. So what happens then? There's been no change in price, no change in quantity demanded, but the quantity supplied by Korean farmers has increased. There is now a need for fewer apple imports in South Korea. So our original quantity of imports no longer applies. And what we see instead is that the quantity of imports is now smaller. So imports with the subsidy are less than they were before the subsidy. Next, we can evaluate the effect of the subsidy on different stakeholders in South Korea and abroad. We have quite a bit of analysis to do here because it's not clear from the graph whether consumers and producers are harmed or helped by the subsidy. 
So in order to analyze that, we need to look at the areas of consumer and producer surplus in the market for apples before and after the subsidy. You'll recall from a previous lesson showing the gains from international trade in a supply and demand diagram that consumer surplus in a free trade diagram is represented by the triangle below the domestic demand curve and above the world price of PW. In this case, consumer surplus in the Apple market does not change following the subsidy. So the yellow triangle represents the consumer surplus both before and after the subsidy for Apple growers. Producer surplus in a free trade diagram is represented by the area below the price and above the supply curve. But here's where things get a little complicated in our subsidy diagram. Since a subsidy is a payment from the government to producers per unit produced, we need to show the price that Apple producers in South Korea will actually receive for their apples after they have received the subsidy from the government. So here's how we can look at this. The price that consumers pay is PW. But the price Apple producers will actually receive is something greater than PW. The amount they receive is PW plus the subsidy. And the subsidy is the vertical distance between the two supply curves. So to find the price that producers actually receive for their apples, we can go up to the original supply curve, which illustrates the distance between the two supply curves, and I can call this PS for the price the producers receive with the subsidy. So PS represents the price with the subsidy, and it's higher than PW, the price consumers pay. In other words, what has happened is that while consumer surpluses remain the same, producer surpluses increased from a small triangle before the subsidy, would have been below PW and above domestic supply, to now a larger triangle all the way up to PS and out to QSK1. So the producer surplus has notably increased in the market for apples in South Korea. There has been an increase in total welfare between consumers and producers. So, so far it looks as if there is no loss of welfare in the market for apples because there is no change in consumer surplus since price consumers pay remains the same and quantity demanded remains the same. What about domestic producers? There has actually been an increase in domestic producer surplus since the price domestic producers receive, including the subsidy, is higher than PW and the quantity produced has increased. Clearly producers are better off with the subsidy and consumers are no worse off. So there's been no negative effect on the Apple market itself, at least domestically. Let's have a look at foreign producers. In purple I'm going to outline the area of foreign producer revenue before the subsidy. Everything below PW and in between QSK and QDK represents foreign producer revenues. It's the rectangle representing the amount of money earned by foreign producers from selling their apples to South Korea. Foreign producers are going to be worse off following the subsidy. There's no doubt about that. So the area of foreign producer revenue is now a smaller quantity of imports times the same price. So the purple rectangle has shrunk. Foreign producers are worse off. They'll earn less revenue because imports are fewer and the price has remained the same. So total revenue is found by multiplying the price times the quantity and since the quantity has decreased foreign producers experience less revenue following this subsidy than they did before. Now here's where we can find the inefficiency from a subsidy for Korean apple producers. We need to look at the cost of the subsidy for Korean taxpayers and the government and then compare that to the increase in the benefit to Korean stakeholders. So to conclude here, I'm going to outline in black the cost of the subsidy. The subsidy costs the government the vertical distance between the two supply curves. That's this vertical distance. And the quantity of apples being subsidized is from zero to QSK1, the total quantity supplied in South Korea. So the rectangle that I'm outlining in black represents the cost to Korean taxpayers of this subsidy. So Korean taxpayers and the government are worse off because tax revenue is allocated towards Apple subsidies. Now what's the opportunity cost of subsidizing Apple producers? This might mean less money available for other government programs or it may mean higher taxes 
paid by Korean households. So there's always an opportunity cost. And to determine whether or not the subsidy increases or decreases total welfare in South Korea, we have to compare the cost of the subsidy to the benefit of the subsidy. So let's go back and review what the benefit was. Consumers were no better off following the subsidy. So there's no actual benefit to Apple consumers in South Korea. Producers were made better off. So there was an increase in producer surplus represented by the increase in the size of the green triangle representing producer surplus. The red outlined area on my graph represents the increase in producer surplus or the net benefit of the subsidy. The black outlined rectangle represents the net cost of the subsidy. So what is the net effect on total welfare? To answer this we must compare the sizes of the red area and the black area. Clearly the black rectangle is larger than the red area. The amount by which the black rectangle is larger than the red area is this triangle right here in the right hand side of the area representing the cost of the subsidy to Korean taxpayers. The black shaded area on my graph represents what do you think? Well what does black represent in other graphs that I've used in this unit? It represents the loss of total welfare. We can say that there is a loss of total welfare represented by the amount by which the cost of the subsidy exceeds the subsidy's benefit, which was the increase in producer surplus. Just like with other forms of protectionism, there is a loss of total welfare incurred on society because of the government's attempt to protect certain stakeholders within the economy. In this case, the Korean government decided to protect Korean apple growers by giving them taxpayer money in order to increase the domestic supply and reduce the quantity of apple imports. On the surface, it appears that nobody is harmed by this decision. Consumers are not made worse off and producers are made better off. With that analysis alone, you might say that the subsidy increases welfare in South Korea. However, that fails to account for the cost of the subsidy to taxpayers and the rest of society. Anytime government spends taxpayers' money on something like a subsidy for particular producers within the economy, there is an opportunity cost. Less money available for education, less money available for health care or infrastructure or other important goods that South Korea could benefit from. Or maybe taxes had to be raised on households in order to pay for the subsidy. Either way, the net effect on total welfare is negative by the black triangle in our graph. The cost exceeds the benefit. This is a simple example of cost-benefit analysis, which is something at the core of most of economics. So that concludes our lessons on protectionism. We learned about protectionist tariffs, protectionist quotas, and protectionist subsidies. And when we take into account the net effect on total welfare of all of these forms of protectionism, we saw that there was a deadweight loss. Does this mean that protectionism should never be used? Not necessarily. Something you will probably evaluate in your class when discussing protectionism is the circumstances under which it might be justified. There are certainly some cases where protecting domestic industries might be in the best interest of society. For example, strategic industries such as military or defense. A country might not want to import its military technology. Therefore, protecting those industries is very important. Other examples might be sunset or sunrise industries. Countries might choose to protect infant industries that are new and can't compete with larger foreign producers but are deemed to be important for the economy. Protecting infant or sunrise industries in developing countries might be a strategy for economic development. Once they've achieved economies of scale, protectionism can be reduced and the firms can be large enough to compete with foreign producers. Sunset industries are kind of on the other hand. More industrialized countries might have industries that are on their way out and the government knows this. Protectionism might be used just to soften the decline of an industry such as televisions in the United States, for example. Today, no televisions are produced in the U.S., but for a couple decades, that industry was in decline and it might have been in the interest of the government to protect the workers in that industry before it eventually collapsed. To review, in this lesson we've defined protectionist subsidies, we've analyzed their effects on various stakeholders, concluding that in most circumstances a protectionist subsidy will lead to a deadweight loss or a loss of total welfare. We've then evaluated protectionism as a whole by looking at circumstances under which protectionism might be justified, including the strategic argument and sunset and sunrise industries. Here we go.